In this last video, I want to talk about time series analysis, which is a little bit different from panel data design. So in time series analysis, we have one person measured over a long time, where in panel data design, we have many people measured on several occasions. All right, and we see this data uh, pop up a lot nowadays, and that's especially because um, it is now very easy to collect the data with smartphone app like this one. This is actually a non-existing app. It's a test version we played around with at some point. We have a lot of these apps, and it's very easy now to, uh, to gather multiple observations of people. And a, a reason why people like the time series analysis is because we can get a model per person if we have enough uh, observability. Now, of course, these models can get quite complicated quite fast, so you need a lot of observations per person, but if you get them, then there's a very interesting ideographic method that you can, uh, can, uh, can look at. So uh, in this case, you look at one person measured several times in a short period. And then there's also some models for multiple people measured multiple times. Then you're looking more at multi-level modeling. Uh, that can be done in SAP, but then also taking into temp uh, temporal facts and stuff into account, it gets a bit tricky at some point. Uh, so there's some other software for that. But some of that you can also do in SEM. I won't talk about that here. Uh, the main problem with this uh, with this kind of data is that we can no longer assume uh, cases to be independent. So that means that normally we have our rows in the data set, and those uh, are people right, or uh, observations, and we expect these to be independent. So there's not actual correlations between these observations. Uh, if we already have the model in place, so if we just know that on average people score like, I don't know, five or like a hundred in IQ test, then uh, we can not predict the next observation better from the previous observation. Uh, then we could already predict it alone with our model. And that's very important because the likelihood uh, is a uh, product, right? Or the log likelihood is a sum. If and only if cases are independent, but this is no longer the case in, uh, in time series data. So that's actually quite problematic, right? And in time series data, those violations or the temporal dependency is actually what you're interested in. So um, we cannot assume them to be independent, right? So if we know that someone is very tired, like in the morning or at nine o'clock, maybe this, this person is just very tired that day and we can predict that person will probably still be very tired at 10 o'clock, regardless of if this person is overall very tired or not. So what do we do? We need to uh, make two very strong assumptions here. One is that the model should not change over time. There are some ways around it, but then again, you're probably stepping outside of the SEM world if you do that. Um, but yeah, you, you could get around it in a way. Uh, but mostly you have to assume that uh, the model is stationary so that every observation we have for a person is a replication for the same model. And we need to uh, take into account that there is some sort of graph factorization going on in the, in the data set. What I mean with that is that um, we have to assume that there is some sort of structure in the dependency violations. So this is the simplest structure. This is now like a, uh, a vector, right? Uh, and uh, I guess it's a bit not different notation than we used to, but okay. So this is a vector of responses at time point one of a person P. And then uh, this tells us that we assume everything is independent of each other, right? So this is what we would get with cross-sectional data. The lag what factorization is uh, a bit more complicated. And there, we assume that there's this factorization. And this means that, let's say this, if this is 9 o'clock, and this is 12 o'clock, and this is like 3 o'clock, then the scores at 9 o'clock are independent from the scores at 3 o'clock, given the scores at 12 o'clock. So that's very interesting, right? So we know that this means that these are correlated with each other. We just we can explain that correlation with this path from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock and with this path from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock. So you can see it as saying, okay, the future is independent from the past given the present. And that's actually a very strong, uh, nice assumption, I think. All right, so I always use the lag one assumption because it's the simplest one that we can do to get rid of violations of dependency um, while still being relatively simple, right? This arrow here, these are vectors, right? So this arrow here might actually represent a lot of parameters, like a whole network worth of parameters. These are 10 
items, then this would might be 100 parameters. So then if you go to a lag 2 effect, if we add like another lag 2 effect as well, then this might just add 100 parameters to our model, which is uh, not really what we want. But we could do it. So many people do do this as well, this factorization, especially if you have a factor model over time. You could also make a, a further complication like this. But it has to be some sort of structured uh, structure, right? So if you do like lag 3 effects and lag 4 effects and lag 5 effects, then at some point we, uh, there's no way you can have to fit the model. All right. So suppose you have uh, five measurements of a, a, a person, right? So we have uh, three variables. So we have one, two, three variables. And we have uh, five observations. Right? So this is like T is one, T is two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are just uh, scores. I, mean, I just generated these. And this is what your data might look like. Then the way that you would handle this data if we would take the exact same approach that we've been taking previously, which is maximum likelihood estimation, or just general any likelihood-based methods, that would also include uh, the, the Bayesian way, I, I guess. Although, you know, the Bayesian way, we can, uh, it, it's the same likelihood, but we can phrase it a bit simpler. But in maximum like estimation, what we would uh, uh, have to do then is take into account that these scores are not independent from these, and they're not independent from these, and they're not independent from these. All right? So there are correlations here. They're modeled according to some factorization, but there are still correlations that we kind of need to model. So the way that that's, that can be done is by modeling the entire data set as a single vector. So we vectorize the entire data set and then treating that as one observation, like one case. That's actually doable in SEM, as long as this covariance structure is very structured. We still have uh, degrees of freedom and stuff. So uh, that can be done, right? So then uh, what you would do is you would vectorize this whole uh, data set. So we get one huge factor of data with suddenly not three variables, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 variables. And this is only with five observations, right? If this is like a hundred or so, we have like uh, 300 variables or so. So we have 300 variables and then we have, uh, or here 15. And then we can model that with the mean factor, which is of size uh, right, 15 and a covariance matrix, which is of size 15 times 15. Uh, that's already a big covariance matrix. If you have a hundred observations, and that would be like uh, 300 times 300 covariance matrix, and it becomes really big, really fast. But that's uh, the way to do it. And then we would have to uh, like compute the implied covariance between the first and the second observation, between the first and third, between the first and fourth. It's a highly structured form of sigma. And then we could uh, model that all and put it in a software and uh, estimate the likelihood. That's the actual way to do maximum like estimation in time series analysis. Now, the problem with this is that this uh, can be done, but it's uh, highly complex. And at some point, uh, your software will just explode. But actually, last year, I tried implementing this form in psychometrics. And then like with it worked for like two variables, maybe three or like 50 observations or so at most. Right, and then uh, because you need to inverse sigma and stuff, if you compute uh, likelihood, and you know that that becomes really uh, complicated very fast. Um, so this typically doesn't uh, really work very. But if you really want to do proper maximum likelihood estimation for time series, that's the way to do it. Right, it, it's very uh, tricky. Luckily, there's another way to do this, and that's by using a trick. And this trick is extremely common. You've probably seen it before if you did network analysis as well. Um, it's used all the time. So the trick oops, is to copy the data set and append it. So rather than modeling like the score factor at time point t, where t is just any time point, like one, two, three, four, five, just like we had like p before for the person, now we have t for time series for case, or this should have been like t as well. Then uh, uh, we, what we do is we make a copy and we model that together with the previous time point. Right, so here we have our data set, but now what we did is we made a copy of the data set and put it here. All right, so this is simply this, shifted by one row. And this is simply that shifted by one row. 
And this is simply that gifted by one row. All right, and uh, we go on like that. So if we, uh, so basically we shift the whole data set by one row, which is nice. Right? And then uh, these are of course uh, missing data because we don't have uh, time point zero, right? We have time point one. So that we can do, and then we can just uh, model uh, this structure. So what we then get is a duplex matrix, which is the variance coverage matrix, is then a block matrix, where we have the time series uh, are the the, the variance coverage matrix in the same time point. All right, this is the same one, or it should be the same, uh, because you know it doesn't matter if t is t is minus one. This is just within the same time point, and these are the lag one uh, covariances. Yeah. And this is for a lag one factorization. If we do want a lag two model, we could you know uh, make this one bigger and then uh, like make another copy of this here with uh, t minus two. And then this would become sigma t minus two with t sigma t minus one with t sigma t t again, or this will be t minus one t minus two. And this one transpose there, this one transpose there. So we get a three by three matrix. And that we can just put in SEM model, in SEM matrix, and then model it like we would normally, ignoring now that these are uh, consecutive cases, because we already put the temporal dependency in the case itself. Yeah. And um, one thing that you can also do then is take into account that maybe like uh, four is the last measurement of one night of a day, and then five is the first measurement of the next day, so there's a night in between. So then, uh, in that case, we might want to take out uh, this row because we don't want to predict the first observation of the day from the last observation of the previous day. But this works. This is what you'll see pretty much all the time now. Like almost every model fitted on the time series with maximum likelihood estimation uh, will use this way. It's not actually maximum likelihood estimation. It's more like a pseudo maximum likelihood estimation. So that's the downside of this method is that this is not the true likelihood. So you get a BSC value from it, but that BSC value is not the actual true BSC of the data because that's not the actual true likelihood of the data that we fit the model to. But a lot of simulation studies were, uh, show that this still works very well, actually. So the standard errors get a bit, uh, are not exactly right at lower sample sizes, but uh, this approach works uh, very well. So Many people are just like okay with using it. One other problem is that the lag assumption, the factorization is now an assumption. Right? So in the previous slide, I said that you would have to model the uh, variance coverage structure yourself right? uh, and then imply the, the add implied like lag two, lag three, lag four correlations. But now that's not included. So we only have the lag one factorization here. And if we include that, we have a saturated model. Right? So the lag factorization is now an assumption. If I do it like this, I cannot get evidence that my lag one model does not fit because the lag one model would be the perfect saturated model. Unless I do it like this with the three, uh, uh, I add lag t, t minus two as well, and I fit a lag t, uh, one model, then I could see if that fits or not. Right? So, but if you do that, you make the model more complicated because you uh, might lose some observation because you get more missing data points as well. So that's a bit of a, a caveat with that approach. Now with that in mind, um, this is what you do and then you can just fit SEM models to it. So a few SEM models, uh, the main ones that you will see, this is a figure that was made by Alan Hamaker because I think this is the most beautiful dynamical factor model I've ever seen, so I didn't want to bother making that myself. Um, the main thing that you will see are these dynamic factor models. And that will look like this. So here we fit it at so t minus 1, t, and t plus 1 in this case. You could also do t minus 2, t minus 1, or t, right? Or in case we only use the lag 1 factorization duplex matrix, we would only basically have uh, this part of the model here. Where we only have a lag one. Right? So then we have a, a factor model, and then these factors like uh, predict each other over time, very much in the same way that we do in the prospect panel model. 
except that now we don't have to add a random intercept because uh, this is already a within person model because we fit it on an NS1 data set. And uh, then this can tell me like, okay, so we have like an auto regression over time. That's usually called inertia. We have a cross legged uh, effect here where like A causes, or A2 causes A1 over time, for example. And we can also do other things. So we could do uh, not factors here, or we could represent every item here with one latent variable by itself. And then you get a vector auto regressive model. So you don't have latents really, you just represent these with dummy latents. And then you get a far model, and that's actually what we've been seeing in the network world to draw like temporal networks. With these dynamic factor models, you can also do where you have these factors like autocorrelating or causing each other over time. This is what you see a lot. Now. And there's some other models as well that you can do. Now, one thing I've been doing uh, last year is to add uh, a network to that because uh, uh, that's my thing. So uh, what I did here in this paper, um, uh, which uses psychometrics is I had a, a factor model for let's say five factors for a bunch of indicators based on, from a time series analysis. And then uh, you see here there are no like things between them. That's because those are included here. So you have a contemporaneous effect and a temporal effect. And these temporal effects are then your, um, well, basically this is a dynamic factor model. So we can go back to this one. Then your temporal effects are here, but then drawn as a network. And your contemporaneous effects are these correlations, but then uh, fitted as a partial correlation network instead of a marginal correlation model, right? Which I showed in the previous, or uh, actually two videos ago, where you replace like uh, Psi with uh, the invert or Omega Psi. So that's the idea here. And then there's some uh, bootstrapping to see if the uh, if, if these results, like this model search is stable. So I use a model search approach that uses like multiplications and things like that. So then you want the bootstrap as well to see if you get uh, stable results. So you can read up about this uh, in this paper that I wrote, which also has a lot of information about uh, panel data designs as well, where you can fit a model like this also from, uh, from panel data. Okay, and that's it for the last video of, uh, of uh, both courses, actually. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this course. Good luck with your uh, final project. And uh, if you are watching this course uh, without being in the class, uh, if you have any feedback, please let me know. I disabled the comments uh, uh, on these videos, but you can always uh, reach me by email or, or any other means. All right. Good luck with uh, finishing up the course and uh, I hope you'll have a nice summer afterwards.